Hey everyone, before we start this video, I'd like to make amends for some minor mistakes I made with the previous three videos regarding release dates of the Mega Man games. When referring to when they were released, I referred to them as worldwide releases, when in actuality, only some of them meant for Japan. So, here are the corrections. Apologies for any errors, unlike Mega Man, I'm only human after all, so with that in mind, please enjoy the rest of the video, this time with the correct release date for North America. Hello everyone, Alec Elger, the SideQuest Gamer, and welcome to part 4 of my classic Mega Man NES retrospective, where I'll be looking at Mega Man 4. This game is kind of the turning point of the classic series, where some fans just kind of left classic Mega Man altogether, well at least until 9 and 10 came out. But other people seem to like it, leaving kind of a divide in the community as to whether Mega Man 4 is a good follow-up to the revered Mega Man 3. If there's any truth in the world, the subjectivity of the Mega Man fanbase is all over the place. While almost every Sonic fan seems to agree that Sonic 3 and Knuckles is the best 2D Sonic game, or almost every Poke fan thinks Pokemon Gen 2 was the best of them all, the Mega Man fanbase is like divided on everything. But with the Mega Man franchise, it offers a little bit of everything to everyone. Some play for the weapon types, some play for the boss battles, some play for the non-linearity. It's quite a fascinating discussion, especially on the Mega Man forums, and Mega Man 4 is one of those interesting conversations to have. Some Mega Man fans like this game enough, but I've encountered quite a number of people who don't really care for it for one reason or another. And if we're going to be honest, I love Mega Man 4, like, a lot more than the first three. Mega Man 4 was developed by Inafune and company over at Capcom. Unlike Mega Man 3's development, they had very few problems when it comes to this game's development cycle. Inafune designed new characters like Dr. Cossack, the antagonist of this game, as well as his daughter Kalinka Cossack, but the most noteworthy design was for the little helper robot known as Eddie that serves as basically an item lottery for whenever Mega Man encounters him. This was also the first game where Hayato Kaji joined the team and would stay with the team to develop the many sequels to come. Kaji is responsible for the introduction of the controversial chargeable Mega Buster, since it's two or three times as powerful as one normal shot of the Mega Buster, and this could either make or break the game for some people. And of course, the Robot Master designs were contributed by artists from all over Japan who sent in their submissions, and winners would get a rare Mega Man 4 Golden cartridge. One of these winners being Yusuke Murata, who would later become the artist of the hit manga One Punch Man. He contributed the design of Dustman when he was 12, and I wonder if he still has his Mega Man 4 Golden cartridge. This isn't the last time he wins a Robot Master art contest either, and it's undoubtedly fascinating to see his humble origins as an artist. Some of these art submissions seem to impress the devs at Capcom so much that they scrapped an entire level and built a new one from scratch just to go with Skullman's design. Mega Man 4 was finally released in Japan in 1991, with America not getting their copies until early 1992. It only sold around 900,000 copies worldwide, with 500,000 being sold in America. It's most likely due to how this game came out after the Super Famicom and SNES came out before this game's release, but knowing Capcom would make two more Mega Man games on the NES, I'm guessing it didn't cost them too much to make a 16-level NES run-and-gun platformer such as Mega Man, whereas in 1987, it was a different story. Capcom back then only had a few titles under their belt, but now Capcom is on top, not just from the home console market, but also in the arcade, with 1991 Street Fighter 2 being a hit. And with Mega Man 5 and 6 coming out on the NES after 4, I have a feeling Capcom knew what they were doing from a business perspective, which is now making technical B-grade video games for those who weren't quite ready to jump ship to the SNES. Although, a used cartridge of Mega Man 4 is going for quite a bit online. If only I could go back in time and buy the game when it was cheap. 
And as I said before, this is a turning point for the Mega Man series, especially for the fan base. as initially and retrospectively, people seem to like it but find it underwhelming due to being just another Mega Man game with not a whole lot new added to the table, with some people being annoyed by the most significant new addition to the game being the chargeable Mega Buster. I hear even gamers around my age say that the Charge Buster is overpowered so much that the other weapons don't have much use. But I don't necessarily agree with the latter. With that being said, let's pop in Mega Man 4 just so I can illustrate as to why someone like me love the game as much as they do. The game begins with an 8-bit animated intro giving us the origin of Mega Man. Better late than never, I guess. From how rock and roll were created by Dr. Light, but then the industrial robots from all over the world started wreaking havoc, as shown by these energy bursts, and turns out Dr. Wily was behind this. Rock volunteered to be converted into a battle robot, and Mega Man was born. This game's version of the origin kind of contradicts Mega Man 2's intro, where Mega Man was solely created to fight against the forces of Dr. Wily, as in Mega Man wasn't anything before that. But Mega Man 3's ending told us Mega Man was a former assistant of Dr. Light, and Mega Man 4 continues this retcon. I'm guessing by creating Mega Man, they actually meant Rock's Mega Man battle functions and not the entirety of Rock himself that was implied in Mega Man 2's intro. Regardless, I do like this intro a lot better as it continues to humanize Rock as a robot with free will. A strong sense of justice isn't something you can just teach to anyone after all. But then it flashes forward to the present, where Mega Man defeated Dr. Wily three times and with Wily being crushed to death in the last game, he's basically done for. And since then, the world has been at peace. Until mysterious Russian scientist Dr. Cossack invents eight robot masters and sends them after Mega Man. And according to the manual, it further elaborates on Dr. Cossack's motivations and apparently he was sick of being in the shadow of Dr. Light's more famous creations. And I've seen enough 1960s movies to know that Russian scientists are no good. Of course, Mega Man riding on top of a train has no fear since he's equipped with a new Charge Buster weapon. This intro is spectacular, and better put together than some would give it credit for. If you look at it from a cinematic perspective, there are touches here and there that just enhance the experience. Like how the city in the background is illuminated by daylight when the text is describing how the world was at peace since Dr. Wily's last defeat. But when talking about Dr. Cossack, the sky all of a sudden turns dark as night, symbolizing the new evil that has arised. The animations for this are very impressive for the time, from the waving of Rock's hair as he's riding the train to the helmet forming as soon as he's ready for battle. It's quite a treat to the eyes and a massive improvement over what Mega Man 2 did with its intro from a technical standpoint. And of course we get the Mega Man 4 title screen with a theme not as good as 2 or 3's title theme, but it's definitely unique in its own right. And of course, it's the same level select as usual. Choose one of eight Robot Master stages to start out with and go on from there. But with the Charge Buster, there's more options for a starter boss battle. They can still put up a difficult fight, but with the E-Tanks that many of these levels are quite generous with, it'll only be challenging and not too frustrating nor pathetically easy. This Charge Buster weapon, despite being divisive among the Mega Man fanbase, I honestly love it, and I disagree with the notion that it's overpowered. Yes, I've criticized Mega Man 2's Metal Blade for being overpowered, and the Charge Buster doesn't come close to it because there are two ways to charge it. The first level charge would only do the same amount of damage as a normal shot, but it can rip through an enemy from one to the next, while a fully charged Mega Buster is three times as powerful as a normal shot. But the consequence is the time needed to charge it to full power, as some enemies are better off being taken out with special weapons than the new Mega Buster. So some situations I found myself using the normal Mega Buster to take out the enemy enemies before they have a chance to attack me. These are usually smaller enemies, but still. Not to mention, unlike the Metal Blade, your aiming is limited to left or right as well as jump height. You can't aim in 8 directions, further showing that in situations like mini bosses or an area with a lot of enemies, sometimes other weapons are of better use than going in there with a charge buster or blazing. Although, I will say I like how the sequels implement the Charge Buster better, where you can't hold the charge if you get hit by an enemy, further adding a consequence to this more powerful weapon. Then again, the sequels Charge Busters have shorter full charge time. But as it is, it's just an extension of the normal Mega Buster. There are standard enemies that don't require it, but there are also a plethora of mini bosses and higher HP enemies that could make use of the Charge Buster or other weapons, like these snails for example in Toadman stage. 
With that being said, I honestly believe that this weapon is balanced enough and the game was designed around this new ability. In fact, the stages seem to be more challenging than those of Mega Man 3, if anything. So it's not like Mega Man 4 would be holding a newcomer's hand, thankfully. The Robot Master stages are quite gimmicky, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means I can remember each stage quite well, just like Mega Man 3 stages, but I'm not sure if I'd say they're an improvement overall. Toad Man's stage is the one most people start out with because he's freaking easy. And because of the waterfalls and gutters that serve as platforms, they're kind of like a slow conveyor belt platform trying to drag you into the abyss. This isn't a problem at all, but when they start throwing in these snail mini bosses, now you have to resist the water while avoiding its bombs and eyeball attack, which can be multitasking hell for some people. Not even five minutes in, and this game is already weird, but it's a fair challenge to start out with. The stage later has a water-filled area with basic platforming, but the level designers sure love their instant kill spikes, and it's not as easy as you would think thanks to these fish that can cause knockback damage. Thankfully these fish can be dodged, but they still present some danger to the player. So one level in, and we already have a good idea of Mega Man 4's design philosophy that will carry over into the following levels. Most of these are fair challenges, but the game gives you a charge buster and a plethora of weapons. Now more than ever, you will need these weapons or you're going to have a bad time. Bright Man's stage is similar to Shadow Man's stage, but not really. The beginning has two types of enemies, flying light bulbs that'll darken the room if killed, and the firework dudes that'll brighten a dark room if killed. This is another unique take on the darkroom concept in platformers, having two types of enemies either make or break a level. But like Shadow Man's stage, you're given enough time to judge the obstacles ahead. You can't ignore the enemies completely, or if you do have to kill the light bulb, immediately shoot at the firework enemy before it falls into the abyss. Sadly, the next platforming challenge that follows up are these crickets that you have to ride on, so it slowly hops to the next cricket or platform and then you jump on that. It's alright, but it's a bit slow paced for a Mega Man game if you you ask me. And while there are these totem pole enemies that constitute as some challenge, they aren't really enough to make this experience interesting. But thankfully after this section, there are these platforms where the brown ones fall off the rails when it reaches the other side, and the green ones stay on the rails. I do like how the first set of these allow you to use them to get an optional E-Tank in an optional area, but the ending section combines the lighting based enemies and the platforms into one deadly section. This is a fairly standard challenge, but even when you're doing everything the game taught you, that very very last flying enemy shows up out of nowhere and can cause knockback damage into the abyss. Jeez, I know this is one enemy, but that is the ultimate beginner's trap. I mean, I got it the second time, but jeez, that can catch a newcomer off guard. Moving on to Feral Man stage, it predictably is a sand-based level. Partially. I do like the inclusion of quicksand with scorpion robot enemies rising out of it, giving the player more things to do than simply hop along so they don't sink to the bottom. Now they have to hop along while avoiding enemies. But the second part of the stage being the underground portion is what some detractors point to when talking about the level design of this game, mainly because it's filled with these instant kill spikes and you have to ride these platforms that shoot from the sides. It's not as problematic to me, but it is pretty slow paced. The platforms telegraph when they'll shoot from the sides giving you a split second to hop onto the next platform without taking a hit, and sure there's the bats, but they can be taken out with some of the acquired weapons, but even then, I just used a charge buster and had little to no issue progressing. I won't deny I died a few times in this section, but that was honestly from my own fault and not the games. And with this being Pharaoh Man stage and a tribute to the ancient Egyptian culture, there's of course mummy robots. Huh, that's cute. Especially with how they program them to appear from a trapdoor animation and then throw their heads at you. The slide ability comes in handy for this type of enemy, and I find it to be a clever inclusion regardless of how gimmicky the design is. The developer should always try to make clever enemies that take advantage of all the default powers, like the slide ability for example, and I feel that they successfully did this with the inclusion of the mummy enemies. So Feral Man stage, it's not the best stage in the game, but it's definitely not one of the worst stages in Mega Man history. Moving on to Ringman stage, oh boy, some fans hate this stage because there's like two ring bots and two hippo bots that serve as mini bosses, which can slow down the pace of the game to a crawl for some people. I definitely would not recommend this stage as a starting level for that reason alone. While the moving beam platforms are quite the refreshing challenge, especially since there's two types of these moving beam platforms that move in opposite directions, the mini bosses can be annoying, unless you use the rain flush for the hippo mini boss. And the flash stopper for these ring bots, so while the stage is fun with these weapons, it can be miserable without them. 
This is notably the first level I encountered this game's new gimmick being Eddie the Item Lottery Helper Robot, and he'll appear in this stage, Dustman's, Diveman's, Skullman's, and even one of the fortress stages later in the game. I like the idea of an item lottery even though it can be exploited whereas you can enter and re-enter until he deposits an item you actually want. This makes it more accessible to newcomers to the Mega Man series, but it doesn't add nor subtract from the difficulty with the exception of E-Tanks and the boss battles. So Ringman stage may not be perfect, but it's more enjoyable with repeat playthroughs than the first playthrough, where you do have to play around with the weapons against the mini bosses to figure out which works, and that's only if you didn't choose a stage to start out with. Dustman Sage starts out combat oriented, but thankfully it's more than just shooting an enemy since there are these infinitely spawning flying enemies that pop out of the bottomless pit. A perfectly timed jump shouldn't be too difficult to pull off given the space between the first and second spawning of these enemies, but I'm a simple man. I prefer to use a flash stopper or skull barrier if I have it. But this stage becomes more unique thanks to this crusher that could kill you in one hit if you're on the lower parts of it, often blocked by destructible blocks. It's quite the fair challenge because instead Instead of stagnating the obstacle's difficulty, it gets progressively harder and harder like a good challenge should. But thankfully there are safe zones to retreat to for the lower parts of the crusher when attempting to destroy all of the blocks, but trying not to get crushed to death at the same time. It's all really about timing and observation, and it's quite enjoyable for that, making this stage one of the better ones in the game. And then there's Skull Man stage. This is honestly my favorite stage in the game. Yes, it's more combat oriented than there is actual platforming gimmicks, but I feel that this should be the textbook example on how to make a stage about climbing ladders and fighting enemies is interesting. For one, there are these narrow platforms on top of one another, with turrets and the ricocheting balls placed here, therefore posing a small threat, but this makes it more engaging than simply crossing these platforms without it. Not to mention this level introduces the Skull Joe enemies that aren't as powerful as the Hammer Joes, mainly because they don't guard themselves well and throw the projectile bone in an arc, but for the slightly trickier platforming sections in the later parts of the stage, there are numerous amounts of them that pose as a knockback threat over several bottomless pits below. So while not the most challenging in the game, this stage is a lot of fun to speed through, especially with the slide ability. And Dive Man Sage is my second favorite. It's similar to Bubble Man Sage and pretty much controls the same, but it's more combat oriented with some platforming here and there. The best platforming obstacles are these green devices that if you get close to, will activate and float up and down. Now the trick is to get over them without taking some knockback damage into the spikes, and thanks to the control you have over how high the jumps underwater are, it's quite satisfying to get it right without falling on top of one of these enemies. There's also of course the whale mini bosses that aren't too difficult with the special weapons, and they mainly fire missiles that are avoidable and destructible. And of course the ending section of this level would be the most challenging because the water surface goes up and down and there are these mines that are triggered within proximity. Because of this, the stakes are quite high yet it's all a fair challenge given how good you are at timing everything. Of course it's easier to use Rush Marine in this section. The placement of the instant kill spikes is fair enough, and honestly I wouldn't have used them if I wasn't recording for a side quest game or review show episode requiring me to talk about each and every item. And last but not least, Drill Man Stage. It's decent enough. It has the usual platforms over spikes with even a high risk high reward 1 up that's optional should you need it. This section does have some interesting ideas such as the falling debris obstacles where I found myself using a mix of skull shield and the flash stopper to avoid, as well as these switches to activate the next platform, but other than the barrage of enemies in the stage, I didn't really find this level so mind-blowingly good. It's not bad by any means, but definitely not my favorite in the game. With that being said, these Robot Master stages are quite fun and consistent in quality. Sure, there is a rare instance of cheap enemy placement, and honestly, some of the mini bosses are a bit too insane for players just using the default weapon. I'd say Mega Man 3's Robot Master stages are overall slightly better in design, but to Mega Man 4's credit, its worst stage isn't as bad as Mega Man 3's worst stage, but I can honestly say the same about the best stages, where the best stage in Mega Man 4 isn't as good as Mega Man 3's best stage. Regardless, the stages are a bit more memorable, but I feel the quality isn't as high as how memorable the stages are. Each stage always tries something different in every section of the level, giving a real sense of progression instead of just stagnating an idea throughout the entire level, making it slightly more challenging every time. 
This is what I like about Mega Man 4 stage design, but some sections are more fun than others, and 3 stages are probably better at pacing, to be honest. The boss battles at the end of each stage tie into this idea a little more. I do like them, but again, some are better than others, especially when fighting them with their weaknesses. I don't know whether I'd say they're overall better or worse than the ones in 3, because while the ones in 3 are consistent in quality but nothing amazing, Mega Man 4 can have some high points with his Robot Master boss battles, but also a few really easy bosses. I do like that because of the Charge Buster, this game is a lot more accessible to choose a starter stage to get the Rock Paper Scissors Mega Man format rolling, but sometimes you may need an E-Tank since the bosses like Skullman have a near unavoidable pellet attack. Of course, the reward of using the correct weapon would be taking down the bosses faster, but with the bosses such as Brightman and the Rain Flush or Feralman and the Flash Stopper, it can make the bosses underwhelming, especially for Feralman's case. What is this? Yay, that was so challenging. I feel so rewarded. And well, Toad Man is a running joke of a boss battle in the Mega Man community since he doesn't even attack unless you're using his weakness, which means you might as well not use the Drill Bomb at all for the eventual boss rush of the game, just to conserve health from his screen nuke attack. But I do think bosses like Drill Man and especially Dust Man are the best examples of good Robot Master boss design. They can be taken out moderately with a default weapon, but even when fighting them with their weaknesses, they still put up a fight that makes you feel tense. But it's by no means cheap, since with bosses like Drillman, you can dodge his surface touch damage attack after going underground by sliding, and defeating them just makes you wipe the sweat off your head. It just makes you think, wow, that was challenging, but it was fun. If you're wondering why I was so critical of the bosses in Mega Man 1 and 2, it's because I know they can do better, and with bosses like Drillman and Dustman, this is an idea I want to be the rule, not the exception. It is disappointing that not all the bosses in the game are like this, but a good portion comes close to this, and some are exactly what I'm describing. You aren't exactly spoon-fed your victories, but you're not exactly frustrated either. It's the perfect balance. And the weapons you get from the bosses are good enough, so much so that the Charge Buster is only an extension of the default buster, rather than as a replacement for all the other weapons. I honestly found myself using the weapons more than ever in the more challenging stages of the game. We have some really great weapons like the Rain Flush, which is great for a screen nuke weapon that damages everything on screen, but doesn't exactly kill everything like higher HP enemies, but it can help damage them, like the Hippopotamus mini boss for example. It's such a pain in the rear just to take it out normally with the default weapon since you have to destroy the pegs underneath in order for it to lower enough so you can actually damage it. But Rain Flush? Oh boy, it can make short work of it. But it does drain away quite a bit of weapons energy so it's not like it can be exploited with little to no consequence. There's also the Flash Stopper that's everything the Time Stopper from Mega Man 2 should have been. For one, it just doesn't drain non-stop and stun everything in place. No, it only uses a bit of weapons energy, stuns enemies in place for a few seconds, and allows for the default buster to be used on stunned enemies. This is fantastic! But it is costly, which is a fine consequence for an effective weapon like this. And I love the Pharaoh shot. You can shoot normal projectiles, or you can charge it to become the big bulging blob of energy. Oh boy, this can really make short work of some of the enemies. The best part is just how this weapon can be shot in many directions, but again, quite a bit of weapon energy is drained away, especially if you're firing charged Pharaoh shots. These three weapons are some of my favorite, and the other ones are not too shabby either. The Drill Bomb is an explosive, offensive weapon, but it is mostly useful for some of the bosses that require you to detonate it mid-air before contact, but the rest of the powers are... decent, but don't really have the effectiveness as the ones mentioned previously. The Skull Shield was good for blocking hits from those falling rocks, but if you have the Time Stopper, you don't have to worry about them at all, kind of making the shield situational use less enticing. The Ring Boomerang is exactly how it sounds. It's a neat offensive weapon against certain types of enemies like the weaker ones, but not necessarily one I use for anything else except for certain boss battles since it's best used as a close range weapon. Not my favorite 
favorite weapon in the game, but has its uses. And the Dust Crusher, it's not one I'd use for anything except for certain boss battles, mainly because I have more effective weapons to use on the weaker enemies. It moves in a straight direction and divides into four diagonal moving pieces, but the problem is those pieces won't likely hit anything without the most precise aiming when it's like, why not just use another weapon like the Rain Flush? It's not a bad weapon, but it's not that great either. And I can't really think of any time I used the dive missiles except for Drillman because it's pretty weak as an offensive weapon. Sure, it's nice that it homes in onto enemies, but again, there are better weapons out there that can do a better job. So when it comes to weapons, there were quite a few I used instead of the Charge Mega Buster given the design of some of these levels, but some of them are better than others, and once you have the half you need, why would you use the other four weapons for anything other than their designated boss battles? It does balance out a permanent need for the Charge Buster, and for what they're worth, they balance out themselves pretty well. The weaker weapons have the lowest energy consumption, as opposed to the more effective ones that have a high energy consumption. Although, I should mention that this game has two or three new helpful items, the Wire Adapter and the Balloon Adapter, as well as the new Rush Jet. The wire adapter and balloon adapters can be found in Dive Man and Pharaoh Man stages respectively by going in an alternate route, and they're nice rewards for Psyquestians like myself who love being rewarded for going out of their way to find these things. And both adapters are pretty useful for the most part. The wire adapter can only go up above and be used if it attaches to a ceiling, making it useful to get to areas Rush Coil couldn't get you up to. But the balloon adapter I didn't really find the need for, except if you don't have the wire adapter, and for the rare instances I need to make temporary platforms to get by an area. And as for this game's version of the Rush Jet, I like how it's more nerfed to continuously fly in one given direction, and the only thing you can do is manipulate him up and down. It doesn't break any boss battles unlike Wily Phase 2 and Mega Man 3, and I know some people may miss the ability to move around anywhere freely like a hovering platform, but it was never really needed in the first place, so I was fine with its exclusion. But now it's time to face the evil Russian scientist himself, Dr. Cossack. Hopefully these fortress stages are a lot more challenging than last time. Will you look at that? After beating the Robot Masters, the game gets straight to the point with Dr. Cossack's castle, or fortress, whatever you call it. It must be evil if it has lightning striking in the background. Must be that secret weather controlling technology that the Russians have in their possession. With stage 1, of course it begins with a snowy ground because every part of Russia is just like Siberia, according to every cartoon ever made. It reintroduces the Skull Joe enemies as well as those dudes that pop out of the abyss, threatening knockback with touch damage and therefore falling into the abyss, but the Skull Barrier and Flash Stopper makes this section a piece of cake. And after that, there's just obstacles that could be bypassed with the helpful items like Rush Jet and Rush Coil, although I don't know why, but these ladder clamps always gave me a hard time thanks to them being indestructible and tend to level themselves parallel to my position to make my life even harder. But the boss in the stage is freaking awesome. It's a giant butterfly that flies around and destroys parts of the stage like the ground you're standing on. What makes it intimidating is how the needle it has can also crush you in one hit. Providing some tension and vulnerability in this battle. I even died a few times due to some careless errors on my part, but it just goes to show how Capcom can most certainly give that one final challenge before a castle stage ends. Wily, I mean Cossack Stage 2, now takes place indoors giving this fortress a sense of being one giant in-game world, where you start from the outside and make it inside. There's nothing too noteworthy here other than how there's a mandatory rush jet section that's a lot better than Doc Robot Needleman's rush jet section. And there are these platforms that have spikes that pop out of the two parallel sides every few seconds that, while won't kill you, would cause touch damage resulting in knockback. This is quite clever, as it involves some precise timing, and there's a visual indicator of when the spikes will switch sides. And other than that, the stage introduces these destructible walls that you can destroy with the drill bomb, and your reward for doing so would be goodies like E-Tanks. The boss battle, while a bit on the easy side, is quite fun and memorable since pieces of it fly past you and the bottom piece requires you to slide under it with the last motion of the piece requiring you to get into the bottom piece before it connects together with the middle and top pieces. And from there you can ride these platforms and shoot the eye with a dust crusher from the inside, but also have to be careful not to get hit by the eye's projectiles. This is honestly one of the more creative boss battles in the series if you ask me. Sure it may be easy, but I admire the idea behind 
find it. But stage 3 is one of the most fun castle stages I've ever played in the series. Yes, while auto-scrolling is a pet peeve for some people, I never minded it as long as the obstacles ahead are fair and reasonable and I'm given enough time to go from one platform to the other. And boy are these challenges reasonable. There is a lot of little platforms with turrets and these clockwise moving enemies that can cause touch damage, but I just love these platforms that can descend when standing on them, but ascend when you jump, making this a really thrilling challenge. Although the one instance of saw blades is rather demanding of precise timing when it comes to jumps, even the flash stopper didn't help much with touch damage, then again there is a rush jet, but still. And the boss battle, or bosses in this case, are decent enough as they walk around the walls and ceiling and shoot projectiles with three platforms to stand on above instant kill spikes. Although at least for the second one puts up more of a fight than the first, the only present danger is being knocked into the insta kill spikes and touch damage can take out quite a bit of health. But it's a pretty easy boss battle and pales in comparison to the previous two, and Cossack Stage 4 on the map shows a diverging pathway before leading to the Russian star. Ooh, non-linear pathways in a Mega Man game. I can't wait to see how they pull this off. The stage has a little bit of everything in terms of enemies, and there's really not much to say other than there's two pathways and the second one is behind a destructible wall, but knowing we have the drill bomb before the Cossack stages, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a second pathway since when it comes to making a diverging path, one should be easier while the other is harder to get to but with more rewards, and because it's pretty easy to get to, the only way you couldn't get to it is say you used the wire adapter way too many times beforehand, but even then that's not likely. And now we have to fight the evil Russian sign. Wait, no boss rush? Sweet! And Cossack himself can be challenging to the inexperienced. Heck, I have trouble avoiding his claw attack that takes out some health when he drops you, and of course he occasionally shoots three projectiles that don't really do much damage, but just when he's low on health, we win the game and that's how Mega Man defeated the Russians. The end. Nah, the next scene is kind of a cop-out. Proto Man shows up and... Are you serious, Capcom? A Russian girl who is dressed like a stereotypical Russian, with a fur coat, long black hat, and everything. <laughs> Never mind. And she claims her father, Dr. Kasak, isn't really evil. And turns out, Dr. Wily was alive the whole time. He held her hostage and forced Dr. Kasak to build the robots needed to kill Mega Man. Wouldn't it just be much easier to program the Robot Masters to rescue Kalinka instead? Cossack begs Mega Man for forgiveness, and Wily shows up, angered that Pro Man betrayed him. Oh, I can't wait until they delve further into his involvement with the story. Come on, there's gotta be more to him than that. But he never shows up again, so it's like, hi Proto Man, bye Proto Man. Just imagine if Mega Man 4 was the only game in its series. Just get rid of the 4 and all. People want to know what to think other than Proto Man was a goon who betrayed Dr. Wily for plot conveniences. Also, how did he get into that flying saucer despite appearing right within Mega Man's sight and not in the safety of some vehicle? This is the same guy that would beg for mercy whenever he's out of the safety of his own vehicle when it's destroyed. But I still want to know how Dr. Wily could have possibly survived that big block that fell on him in the last game. Okay, I'll give you that. We know he was alive from that UFO in the credits scene, but it's oddly small enough to rest on top of that tree. What's up with that? And it still doesn't explain how he could possibly survive that giant block that fell on him. That would have squished him to death. There's no explanation for that. It's dumb. Regardless, we have a second castle to go through. This is a lot better than the Doc Robot stages since we have all new bosses, all new stages, and a pretty consistent difficulty curve that progressively gets harder and harder like it should. Wily Stage 1 starts out with platforming and slide areas filled with nothing but mental enemies that can be kind of a pain since they tend to duck under their hats which are impervious to the default weapon, but are vulnerable when firing their avoidable pellets, making these otherwise weak enemies more intimidating in numbers this late in the game. There's then a water filled section with a lot of instant kill spikes that pretty much are testing your water platforming skills you learned in Dive Man stage, but if you have the energy you can cheese this section with Rush Marine, which is what I would use sometimes, especially near the spike section. And the next part of the level just features a return of the disappearing block platforming over a moving saw blade with a second set over instant kill spikes. 
Not a bad way to evolve the difficulty of these challenges. And now we know why Metool enemies populate this level, because there's a freaking giant Metool that can jump around. But given the slide ability and the need to jump so there's no shock paralysis from the shaking ground after it lands, this boss isn't too difficult. In fact, I'd say it's quite good given the spawning enemies and its variety of attacks. Wily Castle 2 is more platform centric, especially with all the spikes present. And then there's some ladder climbing, with one of the ladders even leading into a trap that causes touch damage. That's kind of cheap, but nothing so irredeemable I don't want to play the game again since it only takes out a portion of the health, but still. And there's nothing much to say other than how there's more of a focus on combat against returning enemies like the bats, the mummies, the caterpillars, etc. But given this game's quality standard, it comes as no surprise that the boss battle at the end of the stage offers a fair and unique challenge where only the top of the boss's head is its weak spot, forcing you to use the platforms to get to an area necessary to fire its weakness at its head. But there's also giant balls that it fires every few seconds, so staying in one place for too long is an invitation for a quick death. It's such a fun boss battle because of this. And finally, we're at the skull part of the fortress. You can tell we're going to meet a challenge unlike any other since it provides you with an E-Tank and some weapon energy. And there are only a few enemies that are quite easy to take out. Let me guess, boss rush? <coughs> Thought so. Yep, just like the two games before it, eight teleporters linked to the eight robot masters you fought before. Fight them again with all your weapons at your disposal, but because it's the same exact eight robot masters, there's really nothing more to talk about. Moving on to the boss battle against Wily himself, it's so easy. If you just stand near its mouth, all of its otherwise intimidating attacks are completely avoidable without any complex maneuvers involved. Just stand, wait for an opening, jump, shoot, it takes damage. It's so insane insultingly easy to be honest. But thankfully that's just for the first phase. The second phase isn't nearly as simple since you need to use your drill bomb and be in an area where you're able to jump, shoot, and be able to detonate the bomb in midair before it touches the crap, and therefore rendering it useless if it touches it. But good luck getting shot at constantly by those purple waves, this boss could have really used some more polish, but with his craft being destroyed he escapes and surprise surprise, there's one more level. And this stage is kind of reminiscent of Mega Man 2's final stage where there are some minor threats before the final battle. There's not really any ambience unlike Mega Man 2's final stage, but there are these caterpillar enemies that infinitely spawn off screen that can be used to grind for weapons energy in case you die at the upcoming boss and respawn from the checkpoint. And the Wily Craft battle isn't too special. It's better than Gamma, I'll give you that, but all it really involves is figuring out where Dr. Wily spawns his craft while avoiding an energy ball he deploys. Wily is quite easy with the Pharaoh shot, especially if you just hold the full charge and jump around, you might just hit the craft with the health pharaoh shot and damaging Dr. Wily as a result, but this boss battle isn't nothing too special because it's that easy. In fact, it's so easy it's underwhelming as a final challenge. Just compare the final boss of Mega Man 2 to that of Mega Man 4, which one honestly makes you wipe sweat off your head because it was such a satisfying challenge. Because Mega Man 4's boss doesn't really do that, it could have been better. And now, it's time to play America's favorite game show. Guess what happens next? It's a hairbrush. Don't ask. Dr. Wily has been defeated by Mega Man and like usual is begging for mercy after being thrown out of his exploding vehicle. Guess what happens next? Is it A. Mega Man leaves Dr. Wily in his fortress? B. Mega Man escapes a collapsing fortress due to some sort of self-destruct sequence? C. Mega Man actually does the smart thing and captures him? Or D. Dr. Wily escapes through some plot contraments doorway that sticks out like a sore thumb? If you picked anything other than D, you're a dumb- I apologize if that was a bit unusual, but I kinda wanna present this disappointing ending in at least a fun way. I know, it's a cutesy Mega Man game where the sole focus is on the gameplay, and I don't really hold much weight to the story as a result, but it's still rather dumb and could've been done better. It really annoyed me on my first playthrough years ago when I was younger, but now it doesn't make the game unsalvageable. At least Dr. Wily's fortress blew up at the end, and Mega Man rides a train back to his family that's happy to see him, which is cute for character interaction. But unlike other classic Mega Man stories, this story in particular doesn't really amount to much other than Mega Man learns to make friends with people from different cultures. 
I don't know. They don't even have a moment after the reveal where Dr. Cossack is indebted to Mega Man. That would have been a nice conclusion to all of this. Heck, why not have Cossack and Kalinka wave goodbye to Mega Man at the train stop? That would have been better and timeless. So, it's a strong beginning with a dumb plot twist near the end, and a contrived ending. Again, I don't expect much from the story, I don't expect it to be Shakespearean and tragic, but as someone who played many of the later entries and especially the Game Boy games, I've seen some pretty entertaining stories with classic Mega Man that occasionally evoke some emotion out of me, so it's not unreasonable to have some expectations when it comes to having a complete story. But all in all, Mega Man 4 is everything I wanted out of a Mega Man game, plus things I didn't know I wanted in a Mega Man game. Mega Man 4, while not perfect in every way, was the very first Mega Man game I can honestly say I had fun all the way through. Mega Man 1 had alright Robot Master stages, but poor Wily Castle stages. Mega Man 2 improved upon both aspects, but there were some levels that were annoying to play through. Mega Man 3 was great except for the Doc Robot stages that padded out the game. But Mega Man 4? I like the Robot Master stages, I love the Cossack Castle stages, and I really like the Wily Castle stages with not one level I would outright consider terrible. At worst, the level could be alright, but that just goes to show that Mega Man 4 is so far the most consistent in its level quality, and that is very admirable. Not to mention that, of all things Mega Man 4 has going for it, the graphics and soundtrack are not really mentioned that much, which is odd given how amazing both aspects of the game are. Yes, there's truth to the saying that graphics don't entirely matter, but I believe they're not all that matter. Good graphics and especially a timeless art style can go a long way, and for an 8-bit game released in 1992, they still look amazing. From the improved sprite work on the Robot Masters where designs like that of Toadman's shows how much more effort was put into these otherwise simple bosses. From adding visible vents on Toadman to the black lines of Feral Man's headpiece, even larger than life enemies look quite good, such as the Hippopotamus mini-bosses in Ringman stage. And some of the backgrounds look quite good too. Skullman stage having mountains in the background, and as you progress, the background switches to a sunset version of that background. It may seem insignificant, but kind of adds some atmosphere to this action-packed stage. Or how Dustman stage has conveyor belts moving in the backgrounds. It just gives these otherwise 2D levels in an 8-bit game a sense of scope that while would have been better on 16-bit hardware, I mean, it was 1992 after all. They did what they could with the hardware limitation, but still managed to deliver a solid presentation overall. Sure, there is some occasional frame dips like in that section with the ladybug enemies and the forming block platforms, but 95% of the time, it's been consistent. And oh boy, the soundtrack continues the series' quality standard with delivering some of the best 8-bit chiptunes of the generation, from the slower-paced intro theme that sets up the game to the title screen that gives off an ominous vibe. I really like the level themes such as Bright Man's that has a rather upbeat melody, Drill Man Stage has a slower paced melody but with a strong percussion, and Skull Man Stage that is strong in both melody and percussion, working cooperatively to deliver a memorable as heck music piece. Even the boss theme is quite spectacular, that while not as good as say Mega Man 2's boss theme, does have some setup before playing the main melody but it does loop quite a bit making it rather short, but regardless it still manages to give the idea that these bosses are menacing, even if it's a bit lighthearted in execution. Oddly, one of the catchier chiptunes in the game is not even a main level theme, but rather what plays in the menu of when you get a new weapon. It has kind of a techno beat going for it, and even though it's compositionally really short, I like it a lot. Too bad what follows is what my millennial comrades would cruelly describe as well. Let's just say the term that describes what happens when there's sexual penetration of your ears but without their consent. That is the really annoying continuous screen in a nutshell. It's also compositionally short, but ugh, it's so annoying! Turn it off! Turn it off! And the fortress stages have their own unique themes that, while are a bit too upbeat given the context of the levels, do their job fine enough. I especially really like Cossack Fortress 2 for the instruments used to give off the sense of being knee deep in enemy territory. It's not perfect for the context, but it's still a good listen regardless. So Mega Man 4's soundtrack, I dare say stands as tall as Mega Man 2 and 3's. 
While Mega Man 2 and 3's soundtrack succeeded more in giving contextually appropriate chip tunes, Mega Man 4 still has more music pieces that stand out quite well enough to be an enjoyable listen in its own right. For the lack of a better word, the soundtrack just hits all the right notes. Ha! <laughs> a music bun. My friend Gavin will love it. Alec, that was terrible! Wait, 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 Gavin, I got another one. The music really struck a chord with me. <laughs> Alec, just stop, you're embarrassing yourself. If it wasn't clear enough, Mega Man 4 is a game I love for many reasons. It shows how good a series can become, and while it's not perfect, it's pretty close to it, all things considered. It delivers on all fronts that make a video game a video game, with no slacking in any aspect. I would honestly recommend this game to anyone who wants a good starting point if Mega Man 2 is too easy for them. And overall, Mega Man 4 is great! Yes, this game is right up there with Mega Man X1 in terms of just how much fun I had with it. While it's not going to win everyone over, I can just go back to this game, try and see what other bosses would be a great starter, and constantly try out all of my weapons in different situations, and still find new ways to replay the game. Mega Man 4, while showing that the series has become more of a franchise, and some may see that as when they lost interest in the series altogether, this game has only piqued my interest in the classic series at how a simple concept like Mega Man has a layer of complexity unseen in any other series before and after. Mega Man 4 is how you reinvent a series from going stale. It keeps the core elements that we know and love, getting rid of all the problems the predecessors had, and adds a brand new addition to combat that changed things for the better if you ask me. And with that being said, join me next time as I look at the next Mega Man entry. Where will he go from here? Will the next entry be on the SNES with all of its 16-bit glory? Yeah, about that. Oh, come on! It can't be that hard to make a classic Mega Man game on 16-bit hardware. Super Nintendo's popular now. Why would they keep making NES games this late in the console's lifespan? Beats me. Well, folks, until Part 5 where I'll look at Mega Man 5 that's still on the NES and it only came out 11 months after Mega Man 4, thank you all so much for watching and remember to stay awesome!